It's all a prophetic symbol telling the story of God's relationship to Israel. So God has been like a faithful husband to Israel. He rescued them out of slavery. He brought them to Mount Sinai, where he entered into a covenant with them. He asked them to be faithful to him alone. But then he brought Israel into the promised land, and they took all the abundance that he gave them, and they dedicated it to the worship of the Canaanite god, Baal. And so God has a legitimate reason. He could end the covenant and divorce Israel, and he thinks about doing so, but instead, he says that he's going to pursue Israel again and renew his covenant with them. And he says why? It's purely because of his own love, compassion, and faithfulness. Hosea then spells out what all this means. He says the consequences for Israel's rebellion will be imminent defeat by other nations and exile. But there's hope for future restoration. One day Israel will once again repent and come back to worship their God. And, Hosea says, he will place over them a new messianic king from the line of David who will bring God's blessing. And so this opening section introduces all the main ideas of the book. Israel has rebelled. God's going to bring severe consequences, but... God's own covenant love and mercy are more powerful than Israel's sin. And so, in the remaining sections of the book, Hosea's poetry explores these themes in more depth. So there are two collections of his accusations and warnings for Israel, and then each of these is concluded by a very hopeful poem about God's mercy and hope for the future. So chapters 4 through 10, Hosea explores the causes and effects of Israel's unfaithfulness. He said numerous times that Israel lacks all knowledge or understanding of God. The Hebrew word to know, which is yada, it's more than just intellectual activity. It describes personal relational knowledge. It's the difference between just knowing about someone and then actually knowing that someone. And God wants Israel to know him like that in a relationship. He wants them to experience his love for them and become the kind of knowledge that transforms their hearts and lives so that they love him in return. And so this is why Hosea is constantly exposing the hypocrisy of Israel's worship. He constantly shows how they're breaking the Ten Commandments, how they're allowing grave injustice in their communities, and then they go to their sacred temples and they offer sacrifices to God like everything is just fine. But it's not fine. And not only because of their hypocrisy, but because they're worshiping all of these other gods, too. He mentions many times their altars to Baal at the cities of Bethel and Gilgal. And not only have they given their allegiance to other gods, Hosea repeatedly accuses Israel for trusting in their political alliances with Egypt and Assyria. So instead of trusting God to protect them, they want to become like these nations and rely solely on military power. And God says it's all going to come crashing down on their heads. Because in not too long, Assyria will turn on them and come to ravage their lands. In this other section of warning, Hosea gives an ancient Israelite history lesson to show how this family has been unfaithful from the beginning. So he alludes to the patriarch Jacob's lying and treachery. Remember Genesis 27 and 28. He alludes to Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. Remember the book of Numbers. He alludes to their appointment of the corrupt king Saul who led the people into sin and disaster. Remember the stories in 1 Samuel. This is all Hosea's way of saying some things in this family never change. So what hope does Hosea have? Well, we know from chapter 3 that God's going to do something to save and restore his people. And that's what these two concluding chapters explore. Chapter 11 is beautiful. The poem depicts God as a loving father who raised his son Israel and then shared everything with him. But the son grew up and rebelled and turned on the father, taking advantage of his generosity. And so in this poem, God is emotionally torn apart. One moment he's angry, and naturally he says he's going to bring severe consequences. But the next moment, he's heartbroken. And then he says that he's moved by his mercy and compassion, and he's going to forgive the son that he loves. He says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? My heart churns inside of me. All my compassion is aroused. And so while God did allow Israel to be conquered by Assyria, face the consequences, that's not God's final word. There's still hope. And that's what the last chapter is about. Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God, but he knows that it won't last because it never has before. And God says that one day he will heal their waywardness and love them freely. God goes on to describe this new healed Israel as a lush tree that will grow deep roots and broad branches and offer shade and fruit to all of the nations. 
It's an image of God's promise to Abraham, how Israel was to become a blessing to the nations. And God's saying, if that's ever going to happen, it's going to require an act of God's grace and healing power to repair the deep brokenness and sinful selfishness of the human heart, so that God's people can receive his love and love him in return. This is what God promises to do. Now, after this poem concludes, we find the very last words of the book. They're like an appended note. They're likely from the author who collected Hosea's poetry and now wants to speak to you, the reader, for a second. And he says, who is wise and discerning to understand all of this? In other words, Hosea's poems. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So the author wants you to know that Hosea's ancient poetry to northern Israel is not locked in the past. It reveals deep truths about God's character and purposes and human nature. And while God should and does bring his justice on human evil, his ultimate purpose, his heart, is to heal and to save his people. And that's what the book of Hosea is all about. Good morning. That's to them readers you were talking about. I got four pair, and these are the only ones I know where it's at. So, <clears throat> scripture reading today of God's Word uh, is Hosea 2, 2 through 5. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert, turn her into a porch land, and say to her thirst, I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adultery. So be it. Okay, what am I going to ask first? Have you been reading your Bible reading? Okay, if you have, you're done with Micah. Okay? You're going to be reading Isaiah pretty much this week. And yesterday and today, you're going to read this book of Hosea. Hmm. <laughs> Tough things to read, isn't it? But if you want to understand about the never-ending, reckless love of God, you've got to realize how unlovable you are first. So let's go to prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you love us so passionately, that you are faithful and true, and your love keeps no records of wrongs. It's absolutely perfect that you love us enough to sacrifice your son's life to save ours to restore us back to a right relationship with you. Your creation in the first place that exists and has our being because it was your will and you gave us the breath of life and you govern each step along the way. May we realize today how much that you love us and give our lives back to you as a pleasing sacrifice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't worry either. This is going to be one of the shortest sermons I give. We're going to look at four verses, and I want to tell you something, four verses, three verses. I don't, you don't have to agree with everything I say. I don't have to agree with everything you say. You don't have to agree with those Bible project videos. That's what I was telling you about earlier, but they're good. But I'm going to tell you that it does say what, what children that uh, Gomer had before she married Hosea. Scripture clearly says that. And if you've been reading along, you understand the dynamics of what's going on in the land. Israel is the northern kingdom. Let's call them Samaria so you can understand it a little bit better. Let's go to John chapter 4 where Jesus comes to the woman at the well and says, you don't worship the things that you think you know about. They're worshiping, but their worship is not worship the way God has told them to worship. 
because they've let pagan idolatry, they've let the world infiltrate their worship. And that is not okay. <laughs> Period. You see it all throughout the Old Testament that God wants His people to be a holy, set-apart people and follow to the letter of the law to teach their children so that their children will not depart from it. What's going on in Samaria at this time? They don't want the people to go down to Jerusalem and worship where the temple is that Solomon built. So they say, let's set up false places of worship. Let's bring in these other things that's pleasing so we can get an attendance in. <laughs> we don't do that today, do we? Okay, I'll stop there. I won't go off on a tangent. So they bring in prostitution into the temples. Now, let's don't point fingers at the prostitutes because prostitutes wouldn't have a job if the men weren't going to them, were they? Right. And saying they were going in the Lord's name. <laughs> how foolish, how far we go when we stray down the wrong path. Our scripture gave us God's judgment on us. He told them to stop. He told them repeatedly to stop. You have been unfaithful to me, and now here's what's going to happen. Hosea is a story of, and maybe some of your Bibles say it, of whoredom, professional adultery. I want to put that in there because it's not just committing adultery. It's you've gone into a professional lifestyle of selling yourself out to someone else. And it's God's story. I named this unfaithfulness, but you're going to see something in a minute. Because that's not the story of Hosea. It is. But see, it's about God's story. How many of you ever read the story of the prodigal son? That's a title. You haven't read the story of the prodigal son. You've read the story of the prodigal father. Because prodigal means to the point of being wasteful. When you first read that story, you think, yeah, that young son, he, he kind of wasted everything. He didn't, ha he didn't have it figured out. Uh-oh, I'm the second son. <laughs> and neither one of them appreciated the father who loved them so much that he would give up whatever. And God is saying here, I love you, my children. I love you so much. You have been professionally unfaithful to many lovers. And you've had children with them. It was easy for Hosea to go get a prostitute wife because they were all over the northern kingdom. And do you think they did not have illegitimate children? Yes, they did. So let's go to Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Chapter, verse 1 just sets the stage so we know the kings that are there, so we know the time frame. But verse 2 says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness. That's why I put the title there. Unfaithfulness to who? To the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Zibli Zibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Verse 4 says, Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Now let me just, like I said, I'm going to concentrate on these three verses. That's it. So hopefully it builds up excitement, and I spur you on to go read it if you haven't read it. Okay? Because it is an amazing love story. There is a movie called that if you haven't seen the movie. It's amazing love story, the story of Hosea. I might have it wrong a little bit, but great movie. I got copies of it. If you want to borrow one, you can see it. Um, basically, it's a youth group encounter where the youth group leader tells this amazing love story of Hosea and Gomer, which again shows God's people that God is an amazing, faithful husband. Okay? Verse 1, though, said, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord God said, Go, okay, go do something. There's all, plenty of commands that say that. Didn't say he had a vision. If you read commentaries and stuff and they didn't bring it up in here, maybe it was a vision. Maybe it didn't really happen because what I want to think from my own wisdom is how in the world could God tell somebody to go marry a, a prostitute? That just doesn't seem logical in my own mind. Does it seem logical to you that God would tell Abraham to go kill his only son? No, in your own wisdom it doesn't. Did, did God tell Abraham to go kill his own son? Most of you will say yes. 
Well, but Abraham didn't have to kill his own son. Well, Hosea had to go marry Gomer. Maybe you disagree with me still. We'll keep going, okay? Marry a promiscuous woman. King James says a woman of whoredom. That was her job. She was a professional prostitute. Why would God want me to do that? To illustrate to us how completely unlovable and unfaithful we are. Let me say it again so you get it. I'm a tramp. I have sold my love out to someone else. I did it when I first saw the fruit and decided to take of it. And I've done it every day of my life since then. And every day of my life I have to acknowledge my God and pray for His will rather than my will. Pray for daily bread rather than the abundance I want to store up. Pray that He will guide me and lead me and fill me because I've been covered with the blood of Jesus Christ and my sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west. Wow! How could God do that for me? Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. Okay, we know that he had children with her. What about the fact that she had children besides that? Well, if you look at, I think I have it here. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Let me read the NLT. Nope, don't have the NLT. Okay, let me find the King James. <laughs> And I'm not telling you go to the King James only because the King James is best. We've had that conversation before. Uh, King James was first. If you want to really go look, go look at the Hebrew words and see what it says. And go bear with me for just a second while I find it. And I will read it in King James. Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. Wait a minute, that's not exactly what the NIV said. It kind of left that out. It said, woman and have children with her. Like I said, if you think, if you rational out the times who the woman was, she would have had children. And it means even more when I realize how much God loves me that he took all the baggage along that I already had. I didn't have to clean up my life first to come to him. He took me just as I was. If you look at the original text, it says, go take a wife and take her children. A wife of whoredom and children of whoredom. And then not only that, don't keep any records of wrongs, right? Isn't that what 1 Corinthians tells us about love? Don't keep any records of wrong. You go ahead and have a relationship with her and you get to know her intimately. And children are a blessing in the heritage from the Lord. You go ahead and have an intimate relationship with her because it's a representation that I want to have an intimate relationship with you. It's what I wanted from the very beginning. It's what I still want. It's what I will passionately pursue and leave the 99 behind to go come after you when you go astray. Do you see what he's trying to tell us? For like an adulterous wife, this people, this church, you and I, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness, of whoredom. To who? To the Lord, your Creator, your God. The whole reason that you exist and have your being, yet He still loves us. <laughs> Not just loves us. If you keep reading in, in Hosea, spoiler alert, <laughs> it's going to tell about the love of Jesus Christ, how much God loves you. So if you got your bulletins, take the unfaithfulness title and mark it out and put radically, lovingly, prodigal, faithful father. Do you get where the story's going? I mean, I'm going to sum it up, like I said, as fast as I can. And she conceived and bore him a son. So we got a relationship. And what happens? We still are unfaithful, aren't we? What does that tell me? That when I do stumble and fall, even though I'm a Christian, all I've got to do is get back up. And He will lovingly wrap His arms around me. 
do you understand the, the peace that comes with that? The peace that surpasses all understanding? That I know how much my heavenly Father loves me. So yeah, I think the story of Hosea, a real prophet in a real time frame with, with real kings, with a name of a woman, with a name of a father, that, Jesus, that God told him to go take this adulterous wife and her children and continue to raise and have children, even though it would be disastrous because she would go back to that life? Yeah, I do think that because it exactly tells my story and how much God loves me and how much Jesus Christ did for me on the cross when he laid down his life for me. Now don't get caught up in the next verse because the next verse is very misunderstood and I'm not going to spend much time on this. I just want you thinking as you read this. It says, Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel. We talked about that before. Jezreel means God sows. It's that valley where Mount Carmel where the things were done there, but then Elijah feared for his life when he saw the glory of God. It's also that place called Armageddon. Okay? The Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Wait a minute. Jehu was a good guy. You remember from reading that? He wasn't part of the lineage of David. He was a northern king, and God said, I'm going to take your kings out, and I'm going to, the commander is going to become king. And Elisha, I think I got it right. If I'm wrong, forgive me, sent his servant. Okay, when first servant, he decided he wanted money and ran after money, okay, and then got leprosy. Whoop, <laughs> okay. And this servant went, feared for his life, and told the commander, you're going to be king. And when he said, hey, commander, he was sitting with a bunch of other commanders. Which one? And he told Jehu, you would be king and go wipe out all the idolatry of this land. And he did. It was a bloodbath, including the southern kingdom and anybody who associated with the 70 sons. And now God's going to punish the house of Jehu for that? First of all, it's the house of Jehu. Remember, he was promised four children that would reign after him. And those four children didn't follow in the ways of the Lord. They were wicked. But Jehu honored God. So why would God be punishing him? He's not. Don't get it off course. Read your commentaries. Absorb all them. He is punishing the house of Jehu, the kings, because it goes all the way back to Saul. And prior to that, when we departed from our king of kings and set up earthly kings. And we for, when we forgot to trust in the Lord and acknowledge Him and reached out to these other kings, even back to Egypt now in this time, and said, help us, save us. But we never cried out to God Almighty to save us and wrap His loving arms around us. You get the story? So in chapter 2, he says, here is the verdict. NLT reads it this way. Merle read NIV this morning. But now bring charges against Israel, the people of God, the church. Your mother, for she is no longer my wife, and I am no longer her husband. Tell her to remove the prostitute's makeup from her face and the clothing that exposes her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her as naked as she was on the day she was born. I will leave her to die of thirst as in a dry and barren wilderness, and I will not love her children. Wow, think back to what all you've read and where Joshua said, choose you this day what's desirable to you. Is it desirable to serve those other gods or is it desirable to serve the Lord your God? But as for me and my household, my children, we will serve the Lord. We will not depart from it. We will train them when we get up, when we go to bed, when we sit down, when we eat and everything because we fear the Lord and we acknowledge Him and we give Him thanks and He will direct our paths. And if that's the case, the kingdoms wouldn't be falling apart, would they? Because they would put their trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords. <laughs> but then we got chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. And there's more chapters to come. That's why I said I'm just giving you a little spoiler. 
though she is loved <clears throat> by another man. She's gone back to exactly what she did after I rescued her from all that. And I set her up on a pedestal and made her my beautiful wife. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Okay, now I don't get the sacred raisin cakes. You won't unless you study a lot. So let me read the NLT. That's why I'm showing you. You can read these different translations to where you understand it. And you pray and you study and you understand that this is God's word. And if you hunger and thirst for it, he will feed you. The NLT says, Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate this crazy, radical love that God has for you. That the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Not just worship them, but love to do this disgraceful thing called adultery. So what did Hosea do? He bought her back. My closing to you is, you have been bought, if you truly believe, by the blood of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. Live like His bride. Please, please, please. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you that we have the freedom in this country to read your word. We're... Carol's told us that we have to smuggle your word into other countries or we have to, believe it or not, use phones <laughs> to read your word. And we can look on our phone and get any translation, any commentary, anything else we want. And we choose to use our phones in a way like that rather than to spread gossip or look at pornography or anything. We choose to study your word and carry it with us wherever we go. May we be a light to this world, Father. May we spread the gospel news. May our works glorify you so that men see your good work, our good works and glorify you, Father. And they're brought to reconciliation through Jesus, to, through Jesus Christ. May we be the hands and feet. May we be the bride that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.